Hi everyone. Shavuot Tov for Sunday and Chag Chanukah Sameach for Chanukah. I'm in awe of what we're about to experience. I'm in awe of the group of members of our community who are gathered here. I don't think we've had a crowd like this since Yom Kippur. Uh, Leah, you and your team have uh, touched something very beautiful and poignant in what people want to share uh, about their lo lived lives and how other people are interested in it when they are, when those stories are shared so openly and so uh, forthrightly. Uh, as some of you know, because I'm not shy about this, I'm not in Los Angeles right now. I'm in Connecticut. I've been here for a few weeks since before Thanksgiving. I came east to move Noah out of her college dorm. And then when the numbers continued to go up in California and the TSA numbers, number of people traveling through the airports went up, we decided that we'd stay still for a bit. And in this era, you can do wor your work from anywhere, particularly since we're no longer having on-campus on davening. And why do I share that with you right now, uh, aside from telling you what time it is where I am? I share with you because I'm in my, the kitchen in the home in which I grew up, in the home which is probably, in the room which is probably still the room uh, in which I have lit Hanukkah candles most often in my life. I've lived in this house since I was four or five years old. And so I've been able to light Hanukkah candles so far this week with my parents, which I've not done in quite some time. Well, why is that interesting? When I grew up, we lit Hanukkah candles in a dark room. I've shared this before in different settings which I learned later on is actually not how it's supposed to be according to Jewish law, according to halakha. According to Jewish law halakha, you're supposed to have at least one other light on in the room. And the reason is you don't wanna make the argument that you are using those Hanukkah candles for light. You're supposed to use your Shabbat candles for light. They're supposed to illuminate your Shabbat table. But the Hanukkah candles are just for us to look at for their symbolism. And so to suggest that you're not actually using your Hanukkah candles for light Traditionally, you're supposed to actually have another light on in the room, but that's not how I grew up. And we've been lighting candles since I've been here in Connecticut, the way I grew up with the room completely dark before we actually light the first light. Why is it interesting? First of all, it's a little more uh, powerful uh, to have the only light in the room be the Hanukkah, even if Jewish law says you're not supposed to do it that way. But the other reason why it's interesting is that you have a greater sense of the darkness amidst the light. It's true that you have a greater sense of the light because it's penetrating the darkness, but you also have a greater sense of the darkness because the darkness is all around you. And darkness, the opposite of light, is something that we don't talk about a lot in life. Light gets a lot of attention. Light gets a lot of love. Darkness, we've been scared of it since we were kids. Darkness always has to be defeated. The dark sparks of our lives, the dark pieces of our psyche, and the dark rooms of our homes must be overcome with light. Well, maybe even though Jewish law frowns upon it, occasionally we should light a Hanukkah in darkness so that we can also regain some of the comfort with the darkness that surrounds us and to live in both the light and the dark. The writer and activist Parker Palmer writes, when we so fear the dark that we demand light around the clock, there can be only one result, artificial light that is glaring and graceless and beyond its borders, a darkness that grows ever more terrifying as we try to hold it off, split off from each other Neither darkness nor light is fit for human habitation. But if we allow the paradox of darkness and light to be, the two will conspire to bring wholeness and health to every living thing. One of the things that I've most appreciated about this series since we've been doing it now these number of years is how each presenter bravely, courageously, honestly, rawly presents light and presents darkness, presents moments of hope and triumph and of stubbing one's toe and feeling bad about oneself and recognizing that it's not just blazing artificial light all the time in life. It's much more complex than that. So how appropriate on this festival of lights during the darkest time of the year 
when we light our Hanukkiyot in dim rooms, that we expose mm -hmm. ourselves once again to the light and a bit of the dark of our presenters tonight who are going to share their Torah, their reality, their truth, their stories, their monologues with us. And we're in for a treat. What I'm going to do now is to begin this uh, event by lighting my own Hanukkah here so we can sing the, the message together. So just travel with me one second. And then I'll introduce Stuart and we'll begin. If you've been to any of these beautiful monologue uh, events that we've had, then Stuart K. Robinson doesn't need any introduction. His own powerful light and spirit speak for themselves. But you should just know these things about him before I, he begins the program itself. He's been a luminary in the entertainment industry for decades and has garnered awards as a director, as a producer, as an actor, as a composer, as a pianist and a writer, both on stage and in movies and TV. And in the Jewish world, he has created quite a name for himself through his leadership on the board of the Pico Union Project and through his creation of Beit Shuba's original musical, Freedom Song, which we had a, had a production of some years ago. If you have active kids and you take them to My Gym Enterprises, you can thank Stuart where he is an executive vice president. But more than anything, we know that you'll pick up on his tremendous spirit and open and loving heart and his ability to draw out of people some of the most important things that they may ever share in their entire lives. Stuart, we're so honored that you're with us again. And peace and God be with you. Thank you, Rob. Uh, I'm going to mute my phone because I have an echo here. Thank you all for being here tonight. It's my pleasure. Uh, Hanukkah has become one of my favorite times of year because I know that every year I get to come to the Beth Am community and make seven or eight new friends, and that's what happens. And as I listen to the beginnings of the cast members' stories, um, I find that I am illuminated, and it give, gives me a new perspective on Hanukkah that perhaps um, 
it's not just a holiday of lighting candles to illuminate. Perhaps it's a time where we illuminate one another. And I think you've started a wonderful tradition of doing that. Um, I'm always brought to mind the song, Mi Yemalel, which says, who can retell the things that befell us? Who can retell? Who can count them? Well, in your community, every year, seven or eight brave souls step forward and share a little bit of their story and therefore a little bit of their light. And I believe that once we begin to share that light with one another, we not only honor the traditions, but we honor our ancestors, we honor our loved ones. And in some way, when our story is told, we live on and those traditions and those loved ones live on. So I thank you for, for coming tonight and welcoming us. I wanna make sure you're all very comfortable. Think of this like as if in this strange time, you came to the synagogue and we were in a big auditorium and at this moment we would lower the lights. So if you wanna lower the lights in the room you're in just to feel more like you're in a theater, please feel free. Uh, we have you muted, but uh, we can see you. So um, know that we're watching your reactions and uh, seeing joy if you have it on your face and disgust if you have it on your face as well. Um, I wanna invite you all at the top of your Zoom screen, you have an option of either gallery view or speaker view. If you click speaker view, then whoever is speaking at the time will dominate your screen. If you're on gallery view, you'll be looking at everyone in the audience and it's not as interesting. So speaker view is the view that you wanna be on. Um, we welcome your applause, even if we can't hear it. And we welcome your comments on the chat feature at the bottom of your screen in the center. There's a chat button. You can uh, activate that and type messages to the cast, to us. Uh, as you see in the chat right now, it says, uh, make sure that your name is listed in your profile. So if you're in speaker view and you have your chat open, you are welcome to interact with us and share this evening. And again, we thank you for being here. Um, let me now um, invite you to open your minds and your hearts to some new stories from some people that you know and some people that you don't know. Allow them to illuminate you in some way. And it's my pleasure at this moment to introduce the guiding force behind the Hanukkah monologues, Leah Mandelbaum. Thank you. Hi, everybody. It is such a pleasure to see all of your faces here tonight. I welcome you. I also want to welcome past storytellers, some of our Hanukkah monologues alum. I see Avi is here and Barbara Maroon Pollock and Mike Cohn and um, a couple others on here. It's so great to have you back. Um, I also want to shout out to the TBA staff for all your support every year on this event and especially give my love to Stuart K. Robinson. Working with you every year is such a joy. Um, so tonight, and this is not in the order of their stories, we have six storytellers. Unfortunately, there were some conflicts with two of them. One may show up towards the end, but these are challenging times. So thank you for your flexibility. But as of now, we have six storytellers um, and not in the order of their stories. We have Inez Tiger, Susan Nemitz, Jerry Abels, Elon Carr, Rob Kuttner, and Adina Hopenstan. So in a moment, I will introduce candle number one. Um, and I just want to share one more time, if you connect to their stories, um, please feel free to, to respond in the chat section. Um, with that said, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our first 
storyteller, candle number one, Adina Hopenstan. So I'm going to share four ways, since it's the fourth night of Hanukkah, that they are lights to the world. So one, very dedicated attorney, talented artist, a lover of drawing, painting, and sketching, brings happiness and full bellies to those she loves through cooking and baking, and mentors her son to blossom his own creativity. With that said, let me introduce Adina Hopenstan. As far back as I can remember, almost every Hanukkah, we would go to the family Hanukkah party. This was tradition, non-negotiable. My sister Ilana and I would climb into my mom's white Cadillac with its burgundy interior to make the long journey to Leisure Village, where four different families of three generations, led by their respective matriarchs, Esther, Lil, Ruthie, and Franya, my grandmother, would get together for the annual smoked fish lakis and sufgan yot filled celebration. It's hard not to think of Hanukkah without thinking of my grandparents. We continue their Hanukkah party tradition 65 years later with these same families, with the newest generation as the eldest has passed, barring Rufi, whose hundredth birthday we celebrated in March, the Sunday before the world closed for COVID-19. When thinking about Hanukkah and its light, literal and figurative, my mind wanders to a hodgepodge of memories about my grandparents, the family Hanukkah party, my grandparents' story of Holocaust survival finally settling in Los Angeles in the early 1950s. I also think about the driving trips with my grandfather behind the wheel of his silver sedan with its rhythmic diesel hum, hours to get to our various national park destinations or with my grandmother building my not so extensive Polish vocabulary with her exclamations directed at my grandfather's driving and the consonant ostrożnie, careful, zwolne, slow down, oh my God, or bożemoj słodka, oh my sweet God. But the story that I want to tell isn't about them directly. It's really a story told to me by them about the act of someone whose name I don't know, of whom I know little about, but who took a definitive action that I can say with confidence altered the course of my family. My grandfather, Szymon Zak Senzakszewski, was an officer in the Polish cavalry in World War II. On September 4, 1939, Grandpapa was mobilized in the cavalry to Ostrowenka, not too far from Białystok. Other than dealing with the occasional horse, because Grandpapa was a veterinarian, he was far from being an equestrian or sportsman of any type. He definitely wasn't a military man, even though he was six foot one and had this booming bass voice that might suggest otherwise. He arrived to Ostrowenka to find that his unit had already scattered. Unable to turn back to Warsaw with other defeated Poles, Grandpapa trekked on foot east to Białystok, avoiding Soviet soldiers on the way. Separated from my grandmother, Franja, who was left behind in Nazi-occupied Warsaw, Grandpapa found himself without any means to make contact, to let her know where he is, where she could find him. He wanted her to reunite with him, of course, but also for her to most definitely leave the Nazi occupation. My grandfather hunkered down in the railway, railroad station, asking anyone and everyone if they were en route to Warsaw and could deliver a message to his wife. Grandpapa found a willing man at the train station to take a note to his wife, and here's a watch. Someone else arrived at the station, agreeing to take a message to Grandmama for Grandpapa's shoes. Another person passed through. She would take a letter to Grandmama, and here's a shirt. Weeks went by, and Grandpapa had no confirmation that any message was being passed along. At the station, he found an officer, maybe a pilot, on his way to France to an attempted regrouping of the Polish army by way of Warsaw. Grandpapa asked him also to deliver a letter to his wife at the veterinary clinic, clinic in Warsaw that he had left behind to let Grandmama know Grandpapa is where to go. The officer said he was in a rush. He wouldn't have time. He couldn't take any message. Grandpapa pleaded. It had been several weeks. So many others said they'd pass along the message, not to mention that Grandpapa had no extra watches, shoes, or shirts left as a bribe. 
The officer relented. He probably wouldn't have time and would promise nothing. But he took the note and the address and left. Meanwhile, back in Warsaw, within only four days of Grandpa's departure, the German army's siege would begin with the Germans reaching the city. Within the week, dive bombers caused widespread fires throughout Warsaw. Roughly two weeks later, the Blitzkrieg began, with the largest air raid ever seen by that time happening in Warsaw, with the Nazis dropping tons of high explosive and incendiary bombs. By the end of September, when the German troops entered the city, the damage was heavy from all of the air attacks and artillery shelling. 40% of Warsaw's buildings were damaged, with another 10% of the city's buildings destroyed altogether. Warsaw surrendered, and on October 1, the Wehrmacht, the Nazi armed forces, entered Warsaw, officially starting the period of German occupation. In mid-October 1939, an officer dressed in black on his way to France arrived at a veterinary clinic on Marshalkovska Street on the first floor of, of a back building just off the street. My grandmother wondered, what is he doing here? Who is he? He had no pet. There was no patient. He wasn't a client. He handed her a letter. She opened the note to see Grandpapa's handwriting. Grandmama smuggled herself out of Warsaw on October 15, 1939 loaded with two sacks filled of heavy books, medical instruments, a photo album, and diplomas. She narrowly left before the ghettoization of Warsaw began, just weeks later. And while my grandparents' ultimate survival story in a hard labor camp in Siberia, Siberia, with the destruction around them of the world and people they knew and loved was far from pleasant, they survived and did so together. One person who was inconvenienced but willing to go out of his way had made such a big impact on the trajectory of their lives. My grandparents were tight-lipped about their Holocaust experience during my mother's and uncle's childhood, only opening up decades later to me, my sister, and cousin Tammy, insistent that we have to remember, never forget, as a generation of the survivors passes with time. And part of this not forgetting may also not just be thinking about the great miracles, but the small ones that happened even in the darkest times of the Pale of Europe. Grandpapa lived to see his first great-granddaughter. My grandmother, mostly bedridden at the time, glowed when she was with baby Ariel, my son, and her fourth great-grandchild that she lived to meet. There is something in this story about the officer that has always resonated for me with this idea of small miracles, of being willing to go out of one's way to do something small that ultimately has a profound, even if unknown, impact. For us, when I think back to my grandfather at the railway platform for weeks and finally seeing my grandmother, Neskadol Haya Sham. Jakuye. Handle number two. Rob Kuttner's family describe him as a light unto the world through working towards healing with his involvement in Alzheimer's research fundraising. He enriches Judaism with his very Torah and regular text study. He spreads democracy with his participation in text banking, postcarding, and persuasive ad writing. And he empowers children with his mentorship of a group of kids who wrote a pandemic comic book. Now let's hear from candle number two, Rob. I encountered a lot of strange things going through 13 years as a Jew at a Southern conservative Presbyterian private school. You see, from kindergarten through 12th grade, I attended the Westminster schools in Atlanta, Georgia, a great school in its own right, and even better in its letters asking for money. Now I'll give my parents credit for moving me there from a school called Trinity because there is a, such a thing as being a little too on the nose. 
But the first time I really became aware of my Jewishness and how it separated me from my classmates was in fifth grade. That was the year my class put on a play about the life of Jesus. And I was cast as the merchant. Although, you know, historically speaking, it could have been worse. They could have made me guy on ladder next to Jesus with hammer and nail on the cross. In junior high, my best friend took me to his church youth group's lock-in. If you don't know what a lock-in is, it's basically where a bunch of kids and their adult supervisors get locked into the church or school building all night long, and they do sort of slumber party activities. Anyway, this was a lot of fun, and it wasn't even particularly Christian or religious. They even showed a cool movie, Dawn of the Dead. Later on, I kind of realized that might be a sort of a mixed message, uh, a zombie movie for kids who've been taught about their savior rising from the dead, but that wasn't my problem. Probably the most memorable outsider Jew moment I had, though, was in sophomore year of high school, when I came in contact with a very special book, one you may have even heard of. What happened was, I was walking down the hall past what I'll call, for lack of a better word, the Christian Youth Lounge. It was the office of this pastor-type guy who everyone just called Woody. He was kind of like a high school guidance counselor, but more concerned with getting you into heaven and into Harvard. Now, I was friends with a lot of the kids who frequented the Christian Youth Lounge, but I was just never comfortable enough to actually go inside. Maybe I thought to them, being a Jew is like being a vampire. I had to be invited to step over the threshold. But on this day, I was almost lured inside by two magical words, ski trip. I heard buzzing about how the Christian campus youth group was gonna go on a ski trip during break. And today was the last day to sign up. And this was very tempting for me. I know some Jews do ski, but my family was more the type of Jewish family that probably wouldn't set up foot on skis except maybe to flee over the Alps from the Nazis. So while many of my friends were talking about skiing, I had never had a chance to do it, but this might be my first ever opportunity. And I started to allow myself the luxury of envisioning everything this thing this trip could offer. Cracking jokes while lacing up giant heavy boots, burning my tongue from hot cocoa. And, and really the skiing wasn't even the best part. Just imagine the daily struggles of me as a nerdy liberal Jewish kid trying to fit in into a Southern conservative football worshiping Christian school. But you know, when everyone's goggled up and bundled into five inches of Gore-Tex laughing and throwing snowballs, there would be no cliques or religions or political parties or really anything separating us at all other than, you know, five inches of Gore-Tex. So I took a deep breath, gathered all my courage, stepped over the vampire border and picked up the clipboard with the sign-up sheet. And it had a suggested packing list. And most of that was the usual stuff you'd expect, wool socks, wool hat, jacket, sweater, second jacket, second sweater. I did mention that we were kids from Georgia, right? Where snow occurs almost as frequently as a Democrat winning political office. But then my eye caught upon the last item on the suggested packing list, a book. And not just any book, a Bible. And of course, at a Christian school, when they say Bible, they're not talking about a Tanakh. No, this was our scripture, plus what I'll call, for lack of a better word, the unauthorized sequel. Suddenly I began to have a very different vision of what this trip might entail for me. Long ski lift rides and long soaks in the hot tub, trapped in some of the increasingly uncomfortable conversations I was beginning to be drawn into by some of my, let's say, freshly evangelical friends. Less, how about those moguls and more, have you accepted Christ into your heart? And as I imagined myself in such a situation, I got very nervous wondering what was my answer? I mean, besides, of course, no. And I realized that I knew very little of my own traditions. I mean, sure, I'd survived Hebrew school and gotten a bar mitzvah. And as far as I knew, I still held a land speed record for Rosetti Adon Alam. But beyond that, what did I really know? Theologically speaking, you could say I was still on the bunny slopes. So I put down the clipboard, withdrew back to the safety of the va vampire realm. And from that day forward, I started delving into my own Jewish roots. And once I got in deep, I couldn't stop. I went to high school in Israel, started keeping kosher, and years later spent a year studying in a Jerusalem yeshiva. So it's funny, I had started in a place of being hyper-conscious of my difference from my peers. And you might think that leaning further into them would accentuate that difference, that feeling of not belonging. But in fact, it had quite the opposite effect. The more I became immersed in my heritage, the more comfortable with who I was, the more comfortable I was around those who had their own different thing going on than me. 
After attending high school in Israel, I came back to Westminster junior year and taught my classmates about Judaism. And in 12th grade, we all took a required class in the New Testament. And I won the class prize. Just think, the book on a packing list that had once long ago sent me into a profound existential stumble was now basically a support beam in my new stronger sense of religious identity. So in the end, I may not have gotten to go on that ski trip, but in my own way, I eventually found the smoothest path down the slippery slope of discovering who I was. And my parents, honestly, were relieved that I found a way to break out of the categories I felt trapped between rather than breaking a leg. And like most Jewish journeys, it all began with a good book. Thank you, Rob. Uh, I'll take candle number three with a song. Let's see what happens. Oh, Hanukkah, oh, Hanukkah, come light the menorah. Let's have a party, we'll all dance the horror. Gather around the table, we'll give you a treat. Dragons to play with and family to pray with and lockers to eat. And while we are dancing, the candles are burning low. One for each night, they will shed a sweet light to remind us of days long ago. Oh, Hanukkah, burning so bright, Hanukkah, long ago. Oh, Hanukkah. Handle. Number four, Susan Nemitz. Susan's four ways she brings light into the world is that she is genuinely curious about others and always available to lend an empathetic ear. Very authentic, what you see is what you get. Brings so much joy and laughter to fellow TVA staff members and an inspiring role model of having tremendous courage and commitment to overcome great challenges. There's an old saying that when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Sometimes that teacher is your own child. Our kids are some of the world's greatest teachers. The beginning of the end of my personal struggle really began when my son Joseph was six and a half years old. I went to check on him before I went to sleep one night. He was sound asleep. I want to be really, really clear. Joseph was healthy. There was nothing wrong with him. He was just sleeping. I sat on the edge of his bed and straightened his covers and found myself starting to cry. And I began to cry uncontrollably. Why was I crying? I was overwhelmed with this crazy feeling that my son was dying. I know that makes no sense at all, but I was sure of it. Of course he wasn't dying, but you couldn't have convinced me of that at the time. This powerful and terrifying feeling seemingly came from nowhere and was scary as hell. I left his room in tears. The next morning I called my friend and told her what had happened and how terrified I had been. She asked me one question, the only question that would have helped. She said, where were you when, when you were Joseph's age? That's all it took. You see, when I was six and a half, my parents sat me down with my brother to talk to us. I had been outside playing with my girlfriend when my dad called us in. I don't remember the exact words my parents used, but they had called us in to tell us they were getting a divorce. I remember clearly my very first thought, uh, uh, yeah, I had to interrupt my playing outside with Kayla for this. I guess a minute or two passed without a reaction from me, at which point my parents said something to each other in Yiddish, 
and asked me if I wanted to go back outside to play. Well, I couldn't get out of there fast enough. From that moment on, I could not or would not link that conversation to the pain and devastation it caused our family. I swallowed that emotion whole. I didn't want to feel the pain. For my subconscious and for me, dealing with emotional pain was easy. We ignored it. That worked for many, many years. Now let's fast forward about 20 years. During my lunch break from work one day, I went to a large department store in a mall. It was winter in Toronto where I lived at the time, which meant that I was dressed for the weather outside and not the weather inside. It's, always, it's never made much sense to me why in cold climates, the hot air is blasting indoors. The heat blasting inside buildings doesn't make the cold outside any more tolerable. It only makes our, my skin dry and my nostrils drier. Anyway. Standing and talking to a saleswoman, I suddenly became way too hot. As I started to unzip my coat and re remove my scarf, I had this overwhelming feeling that I was suffocating. I literally ran out of the store and made a beeline for the outdoor parking lot. As I was running, I ripped off my coat. The freezing cold on my skin helped a little, but I, I, I was reeling from, I had no idea what, I didn't know what had just happened to me. I got into the car, I was shaking and shaken and I went back to work. That was the first of hundreds of horrendous episodes that plagued and terrified me for years. They started to overwhelm my days and upend my life. I never had one of those, I had, I had never, I had many of those episodes. I was able to go to work, but I wasn't able to do much else. It changed my relationship with friends and families. This terror thing had me in its ugly grip. Now, my favorite aunt at the time lived in a condo on the 16th floor. Her home was where we spent the holidays and birthdays or just hung out with each other. It was a refuge for me. She was our matriarch. Her, her, her home was a place where, where I was loved and nourished and never judged. It was Hanukkah, but there was no way I would be able to be with my family at my aunt's for the celebration. Having to take an elevator or just walking into her building was absolutely out of the question. I don't remember specifically what I told my family, but I know I missed our Hanukkah party. I had no idea what the hell was happening to me, but I was sure I was going crazy. Months later, I ran into an old friend who had recently opened his own therapy practice. We spent some time together in a park catching up and I, I started to share with him what was going on. I told him everything and specifically the terror of the episodes. I told him I was scared that I was losing my mind and his response was very, very simple, very calm, very straightforward. He said, there's nothing wrong with you that behavioral therapy can't fix. He said it in such a matter of fact tone that I wondered if he understood the gravity of my life, but at the same time, it calmed me. If he wasn't freaked out, then maybe I shouldn't be either. He seemed so sure of what he was saying, and I was so desperate that I wanted to believe him more than I could ever, ever say. He gave my episodes a name, panic attacks. I had never heard the term, but I had been living with them for a very long time. Hearing a name for this thing that was happening to me was comforting in a way. Knowing that it was something that the doctors knew about maybe meant that I wasn't as far gone as I feared. And most importantly, he said that I could be treated. I made an appointment with a behavioral therapist as soon as I could. It turned out that his office was in a, in a large hospital building. On the day of my first appointment, I got to the door of the hospital and I froze. I opened the door and walked just inside the building, keeping my hand on the door the entire time. I wouldn't allow the door to close behind me for fear it would, be, it would lock me inside. There was no way I could walk in. I called my mother and she left work to come to the hospital to walk me in. We walked arm in arm and I made her promise to wait for me until my session was over. She did that for me for many months until I was able to do it myself. My life had become very, very small. Driving in traffic, elevators, large buildings, crowded spaces, the beach, loud noises, concerts, sporting events, movie theaters were all triggers for me. Early on in my treatment, I learned another new word, agoraphobia. 
The dictionary definition says extreme or irrational fear of entering open or crowded places, of leaving one's own, own home or of being in places from which escape is difficult. In short, home is the only place that is safe. So there you have it. My crazy had a name. I learned that I was a genius at feeling emotion with my head and not my heart. Remember the story about my parents' divorce? I was, I was way more interested in playing with my girlfriend than, going, than talking to my parents about their silly divorce. I shut down any emotion that day and I did so for many, many years. So all that emotion had to come out somewhere and it did. Some people get ulcers, some get horrible headaches. I became agoraphobic. So when Joseph was six and a half, I started to feel what I didn't feel all those years ago. There was my sweet, innocent, trusting son whose world was solid and loving and I was finally able to feel through him. It took a couple of decades for me to live panic free. I still have to be mindful and I still have to check in with myself once in a while, but for the most part, my life is normal. Today, if you and I go to the theater or a sporting event or a concert, I will always leave my seat before the end of the ninth inning. You will find me waiting for you at the nearest exit, just outside the building where it is safe. Candle number five, Elon Carr, protector of the Jewish people combating anti-Semitism around the world, committed and engaged parent, protector of our country, leader in the Jewish community serving on more boards than I have time to name, Elon Carr. Well, thank you. It was uh, shortly after 9-11 and I was a young military officer when I received an email it was a brief email, but one that was unforgettable. It said, Lieutenant Carr, you will shortly receive orders calling you to active duty. After a period of training, you'll be deployed to Iraq. I'll tell you, an email like that changes your day. But while I was scared, of course, as anyone would be to go to war, I was also oddly excited about going to a place that was at once foreign and strange, but also deeply familiar. You see, my family comes from Iraq. And in a strange twist of fate, I was to be sent back to a place from which my mother escaped as a refugee. My mother was a young girl in Baghdad when there was a knock at the door. She remembers it was early in the morning and her father, my grandfather, still had shaving cream on his face. They answered the door and it was soldiers. They said, Mr. Somech, you're coming with us. They were rounding up all the Jews of the community. And after parading my grandfather in leg irons like a slave, they put him in prison. My mother did what no young girl should have to do. She visited her father in prison. And then after two years, he said, flee, don't wait for me. Leave the country. And so my mother, her mother, my grandmother, and my uncle, who was a toddler, escaped first to Iran and then to Israel. Now you can imagine what it was like for me to arrive in Baghdad, the son of that refugee. I was in uniform and I entered this lavish, enormous building that was the presidential palace of Saddam Hussein. We had taken over that building and out of that building, the country was run. It was sort of the capital of the whole country. Well, among my early time there, I saw that the chaplain of the coalition had posted a list of services on the wall, it was an ecumenical list. Catholic mass on Sunday, Protestant worship on Sunday, Shia, Sunni, but there was something missing from the list of services that the chaplain had arranged for troops there. I thought, we came to liberate Iraq and we're paying lip service to anti-Semitism, it's unacceptable. So I marched into the chaplain's office, he, he was a colonel, I was a lieutenant, so I was polite, I said, sir, I see that on the list of services you posted, there's nothing Jewish on it. Is there a reason for that? And his answer was emblematic. 
of our country, our military, and the chaplaincy. He said, yes, there's a reason for it. There's nobody to lead it. I've been asking everyone, can you lead Jewish services? And I said, sir, sign me up. And so in 2003, it was Hanukkah. When we entered a room that was a makeshift chapel, marble walls, lavish ceilings, and we had set a Hanukkiah on a large table, almost like a pedestal. It was a Hanukkiah that had been made by an Iraqi Jewish artist who had also fled Iraq as a child. And in that building, the building from which Saddam Hussein only two years earlier, only 10 years earlier, had ordered that scuds be fired into Israel. From that building, we lit the Hanukkiah. We said the brachot and we sang the song, Banu Choshech Ligarish, we have come to banish darkness. A moment so deeply resonant because a Hanukkah, after all, is about re-sanctifying land defiled by tyranny, exactly what the United States and our coalition partners were in Iraq to do. But Hanukkah isn't only about defeating tyranny. Hanukkah is also about defeating anti-Semitism. Ultimately, that's what the Jews of the Hellenic period faced. When Jerusalem was overrun, when the temple was defiled, <clears throat> when the priests were murdered, it was anti-Semitism that the Maccabees stood up to fight. And it was anti-Semitism over which the Maccabees and the Jewish people triumphed. That is the real miracle of Hanukkah. The lamp oil is a secondary miracle, but the commitment to Jewish heritage and to standing up together shoulder to shoulder to fight danger and challenge, existential danger, that was the real miracle of Hanukkah. And so today, I speak to you as the United States Special Envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism, appointed two years ago by President Trump and Secretary Pompeo to lead America's fight against this recurring indefatigable hatred that is anti-Semitism. Also today, I speak to you again from the Arab world. I'm in the UAE at the moment, but I'm here not for war like I was in Iraq all those years ago. Today I'm here for peace. And let me tell you about another Hanukkah lighting, one that I attended just last night in Dubai. The Jewish community and tourists, many of whom were Israeli, came together in Dubai in an Arab city and lit the Hanukkah and then performed a concert, a concert in Hebrew where they sang Hanukkah songs, where they sang, Od Yavo Shalom Aleinu, may peace come upon us. And when they sang, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, may my right hand wither. This was the Hanukkah lighting that I attended last night in an Arab city, a thriving, powerful economic powerhouse of an Arab city. Because thanks to the Abraham Accords, <clears throat> We're seeing anti-Semitism replaced not only by tolerance, but by philo-Semitism. And so it is my prayer, my friends, that in this Hanukkah, may each and every one of us be inspired of the lights of freedom and peace, the light of Jewish identity. May it shine throughout the world and may it truly usher in an era where philo-Semitism replaces anti-Semitism. And when we build together that future, that just more decent future that our children and grandchildren so richly deserve. Chanukah Sameach.
We are now on candle number six, Jerry Abels. Jerry, a very kind and gentle soul, a man of great integrity, deeply committed to his Judaism, a wonderful father, a wonderful husband, and an exceptional first baseman and right fielder for the Temple Beth Am softball team. Jerry. I don't need to tell you that COVID-19 has negatively affected everyone this year. Everyday events that we took for granted, like going to a Dodgers game or the movies, were nixed. Even annual events like the NCAA March Madness Tournament were canceled. But for me, cancellation of the Los Angeles County Fair has been the hardest to accept. Of all the inconveniences and disruptions that we've had to deal with, why is the fair the one that hurts the most? Well, in 1988, my wife Debbie and I had our first date at the fair. Neither of us had been before, and I took Deb as a favor to her brother. He told me that Deb had recently moved to Los Angeles and was looking to meet new people. I had no idea what I was in for. For those who have never been, the Los Angeles County Fair is the largest in the country and has been held annually at the Pomona Fairgrounds for nearly 100 years. The fair is not an ideal location for a first date. It takes place over three weeks in September when temperatures in Pomona are routinely in the 100s. Thousands of heavily tattooed people attend every day to see farm animals, sample locally grown vegetables, ride the rickety roller coasters, and throw away money to the carnival hucksters. On the plus side, the fair is multicultural with Mexican mariachi bands, Chinese acrobats, and French fries. You can buy anything there, a hot tub, a car, turkey legs the size of a small child. And in the grand tradition of Hanukkah, any food deep fried in oil. I knew none of this when I first suggested to Deb that we attend. This was my poorly thought out idea of how to show a visitor around Los Angeles. On that day in 1988, Deb and I spent at least 10 hours together at the fair. We saw hundreds of farm animals, including pig races, goat milking, and sheep shearing. We rode the rickety roller coasters. We played the carnival games, where we won a three-foot Gumby, which was my first gift to Deb. We drank fresh chocolate milk, and luckily took a photo together in a cramped photo booth. The day was exhausting and exhilarating. By the time I dropped Deb off at her apartment that night, we knew we would get together again. We called this our first all day affair. What we did not know at the time though, is that the fair would become an annual rite for us. We attended as an engaged couple in 1989, as newlyweds in 1990, as a pregnant couple in 1991, and as parents of an infant in 1992. Like at Beth Am, there are some people we see there only once a year. Even as our family grew over the years, the routine largely stayed the same. Each year, we returned to Pomona, to the intense heat, the tattooed crowds, and the smelly animals. While we make sure each year to visit different areas of the fair and take in new experiences, we maintain certain traditions. Our kids know that each visit starts with a trip to the photo booth. As our family grew and the four kids could no longer fit in our booth, they took photos in their own. Every year we drink fresh chocolate milk. Every year we find horribly unhealthy food to eat 
while avoiding the even more horribly unhealthy yet tempting deep fried Snickers bars. The fair also became special to our kids. Our oldest daughter, Becca, had her first taste of blue cotton candy when she was nine months old. I had waited for Deb to step away and would have gotten away with this, but Becca's blue lips ratted me out. Our kids also tried their first ice cream and first monster dill pickle at the fair. As they grew older, they planned the attractions that we would visit during the annual pilgrimage. And as they got much older, they tried to figure out how to return from college to attend with us. In September, 2019, Deb and I trekked to Pomona for our 32nd all day affair. And as you can tell from our 32nd photo booth photo, it was as joyous as the first. In March of this year, even as COVID-19 resulted in stay-at-home orders, cancellation of sports events, I do not recognize the extent of the virus's eventual impact. Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson had recovered quickly, so I thought, I thought this would all go away pretty soon. The reality set in though. In May, when I received an email from the LA County Fair advising that it too would be canceled this year. I texted the news to the family and we all lamented this depressing report. I was resigned to going without the tattooed throngs and chocolate milk this year and did not think about the fair again for months. This past September, during one of our family's weekly Zoom trivia nights, our kids instructed Deb and me to don funny hats. This was odd for we do not have a dress code for trivia night. The kids had set up a photo booth in our sukkah, the only other booth that we visit annually. Wearing our hats, just as we do at the fair, the two kids at home took selfies with us while holding pictures of the other two kids. Our son Joey showed off through Zoom the squash and plants that he is growing in St. Louis. Our daughter Becca served us chocolate milk and added Bailey's Irish cream since we were not driving. Our daughters Jen and Becca had fair related trivia. Deb's mom participated by hosting a virtual ring toss booth. And our daughter Amanda capped off the evening with a gift bag of fair memorabilia and souvenirs, which the fair had kindly donated even though I tried to hide from the kids my disappointment about the fair's cancellation, they knew how important it was to the family and secretly decided to do something about it. While the coronavirus stopped us from going to the fair, we will remember this as the year that the fair came to us. Although we are still very much looking forward to September 3rd, 2021, when the fair is scheduled to reopen in Pomona, it became apparent this year that every day with healthy loved ones can be an all day affair. Candle number seven, Inez Tiger. Inez is an advocate for the Pressman staff's wellness. She makes herself available to those who need, absorbs anxiety and worry with so much balance and compassion and makes sure that as an administration, they're prioritizing the care of teachers. She thinks intentionally and holistically about the raising of children, whether her own, Gabe and Izzy, or kids at Pressman or the students in other parts of the world. She's committed to bringing justice and goodness into this world and a role model for lifelong learning reflection, vulnerability, and courageous conversations. Inez Tiger.
On Saturday, October 27, 2018, a mass shooting took place at the Tree of Life, or Lissimcha congregation, in the Squirrel Hill neighborhood of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The shooter killed 11 people, wounded six, and it became the deadliest attack on the Jewish community in the United States. As I heard the news, my heart rate increased, my breath became shorter, and my mind fogged over. Though I was thousands of miles away, I was immediately taken into a small panic. I started freaking out that the anti-Semitism was coming closer and was going to happen at my school or shul. This was a South African post-traumatic stress moment. I grew up not only with the atrocities of apartheid, but with the threat and incidences of anti-Semitism. My passive and gentle mother, who would never hurt a fly, instructed me that the only time I could hit a person was if they ever called me a bloody Jew. At nine years old, an Afrikaans kid at my school came up to me and said, Hitler didn't do a good enough job and should have killed all of you. I was in shock and froze. I clenched my fists and ran. I went to find Peter, my 13 year old brother, and he came over and beat that kid up. The irony of this typical incident was that Peter got caned for being violent and this kid got off scot-free. For me, it wouldn't be the last time I would run from hate. Moving to America was both a running away from the prejudices and a running to the possibilities of acceptance. It allowed me the freedom to finally come out as a Jew and celebrate openly. I married a Jewish American and we raised our children with our shared traditions and values of menschlichkeit. I was thrilled that I did not have to pass on my generational trauma or my mother's philosophy of violence to my children as they were celebrated for their religion at their public schools and accepted with all of their friends. But over the past five years, the tolerance tide changed in the US. Anti-Semitism was on the rise and my fears started returning. Should I have taught my children to be hypervigilant as I was raised, get them prepared for defending themselves? Or would they inherit my panic and instinct to run? As I watched the Pittsburgh massacre unfold and my fears arise, I knew that my typical trauma response was to flee. But I wanted to resist this urge for Gabe, my son, for Izzy, my daughter, and for myself. I wanted to figure out how I could befriend this fear and lean into what was happening. The rise of Islamophobia increased with 9-11, and here I was, a bystander, and I felt helpless. I didn't want to isolate and be scared. In 2019, I joined Newground, a Muslim-Jewish partnership for change that empowers Jews and Muslims with the skills and the resources to forge relationships and strengthen cooperation on issues of shared concern. Perhaps now I could find a caring way to heal myself and others from this trauma. Newground asks that we walk on ground that we have not walked on before, to connect with people we may not have met before and consider ideas that we may not have considered before. I applied for the Newground Fellowship and felt hopeful that I could transform these childhood fears and biases into meaningful relationships. Then the revolution started in March, 2020 in the middle of a pandemic and Izzy, my 16 year old daughter wanted to protest. I was sheltering in place due to COVID and fearful she would catch it with all the crowds. I supported her desire to be an ally against the injustices and I trusted that America, unlike South Africa, would welcome peaceful protests. She told me she was going with her dad to a protest in Long Beach to stand in front of the police as a barrier and an ally. It was chaos, tear gas and arrests. And though she desperately wanted to stand her ground, she was forced to run away, lock, get lost in the crowd and find her dad. Thankfully, all was okay. Now Izzy was strengthened and energized by her stance and informed me she was going to another protest in Van Nuys the next day. It was rumored to be equally chaotic and possibly violent. I was scared for her. My body was tingling all over in anxiety and I couldn't think. Sarur, one of my Muslim friends, texted that her daughter was also going to this protest. My heart started beating faster and my pulse raced. In the apartheid protest growing up, the police used real bullets and severe violence. Would they do it here? 
people were bringing weapons to the protests in LA. And what if things got out of hand and my daughter was injured or arrested? I asked Saru what she thought about her daughter attending. She replied that she was proud of her and supported her activism. She said she hoped she didn't get arrested. With this thought, my panic increased. And then, unexpectedly, Imran, another Muslim friend and lawyer, texted us the most comforting words. He said, if our children got arrested, to call him. And he sent a photo of his card. He said he would help them. My entire nervous system relaxed. My shoulders dropped and I took a deep breath. Tears started flowing down my cheeks. That simple, kind and caring act from Imran rewired that implicit bias. My fear dissipated. My body calmed and I wished our daughters well on their allyship path. That is a miracle moment, a moment of sacred activism. I am now a mother of an activist in ways I could never have imagined. This is the power of leaning into differences to forge new brain paths, new meanings and new connections. To use neither fists nor flight, but to stand one's ground. No longer a bystander to change. No longer bypassing. I stand in an open and vulnerable relationship with my fear. The eighth candle, the eighth candle is going to be lit. Well, obviously it's the fourth night, but this is symbolic of the eighth candle that I'm lighting for the whole community. We are a beloved community with so many stories and so much warmth and just so much connection, and this is for you. And I can't name off all the names, but the Hetzronis, the Greens, the Alberts, you know, whether it's, you know, the Greensteins or the Freedmans or, you know, just the Carews, everybody. I can't name them all, obviously, but the eighth candle is for all of you. And I'm sending love, and I'm sending love to the storytellers Thank you for your vulnerability. They put a lot of time into this. So if we can now take a moment to just thank our storytellers for their openness and time and vulnerability, please. I, I know it's hard to express. We can't necessarily clap these days, but if you could in some way put um, you know, your applause to them, either through clapping your hands or, or in the chat section. Um, and a huge thanks to Stuart as always. Uh, I love the whole community. I wish you a beautiful rest of your Hanukkah. Thank you for joining us tonight. And may we all be together um, in community next year to celebrate this together. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much. And if the storytellers want to stick around for a little bit, we'd love to uh, catch up with you before you go.
Thanks everybody for coming tonight. We really appreciate it. We value you as a community. And uh, cast members, if you'll all come back on screen just for a minute. I see pre previous cast members on screen. Hi, 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 hi guys. What a pleasure to see you all a year later. Thank you, Avi, for the kindness. Appreciate that. 